Flying is arguably one of the coolest things that humans do. Like, we've got these featherless arms, but we still get to travel like a bird. Well, not exactly like a bird, with the wind rushing under its wings and so much of the world within sight. Instead, we have to hop into airplanes, where we're often just cramped and hungry. Even just boarding a plane requires a ton of patience and following a lot of rules. So why isn't flying more fun? Well, it turns out that's one big question that we can answer with many smaller ones. So please put your chairs and tray tables into their upper right positions to prepare for takeoff. We're about to explore the reasons for all of those inconveniences and the exciting future of air travel that they allow for, like greater energy efficiency and less turbulence. So the first reason flying isn't as much fun for us as it is for the birds, well, there's just so many rules. Here's Michael to explain why you can't use your phone on planes, followed by me telling you why you can't bring a mercury thermometer on a plane. Every time you hop on a plane, you hear some sort of announcement about shutting off your cell phone or putting it into airplane mode. Maybe you listen if you haven't already conked out in your seat, or maybe you ignore the rule and keep texting hoping the flight attendant won't notice. I mean, what's the risk? Will your extra game of words with friends really bring down the plane? Well, it could at least in theory. The concern is that portable electronic devices like your phone or tablet could cause electromagnetic interference that would disrupt the communication or navigational systems in the plane. One type of interference, known as front door interference, is when radio waves leak out windows or other cracks in the metal frame and are detected by the antennas on the outside of the plane. Those antennas are used to communicate with air traffic controllers or with GPS satellites, so it could make it more difficult to send and receive those important messages. There's also back door interference, where radio waves interfere with the signals running through the cables inside the plane which could scramble onboard electronic systems. But since the 1980s, electrical systems on aircraft have been able to withstand lightning and other sources of electromagnetic disturbance, which probably shields them from the tiny amount of interference from a phone or tablet. And no phone, tablet, or any gadget you might try to use during a flight has ever actually been proven to cause serious problems. Individual pilots have claimed that some of their instruments went haywire when passengers turned on certain devices, but it's tough to show cause and effect. Most of the time, when investigators try to recreate the problem, nothing happens. So while some interference is possible, it doesn't seem to happen much, and certainly isn't causing huge problems that jeopardize planes. But there's another reason why cell phones in their full non-airplane mode glory are banned in flight. Back in 1991, when cell phones were basically giant bricks, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, was worried about phones on planes clogging up cell signals for people on the ground. Phones up in the air might be close to a bunch of cell towers at once, confusing the system. Plus, because the airplane is moving super fast, the phones be trying to connect to tower after tower, taking up precious bandwidth. It turns out that doesn't really happen though, because again, planes these days have all that shielding. So having your phone transmitting probably won't bring down the plane or clog up cell networks, but you might as well follow the rules. You're not going to get much cell service up there anyway. You've probably never tried to carry a mercury thermometer or barometer on a plane. But even if you really wanted to, you can't in the US, unless you happen to work for a government weather agency. Now that might seem like another weird restriction, but there is an important reason for it. That tiny bit of liquid metal is fascinating, but really dangerous. Mercury is the only metal that's a liquid at room temperature, which is why it's sometimes called quicksilver, which comes from the Old English for living silver, not the X-Men. And it's especially useful for thermometers because of how much it expands when you heat it. it has what's called a high coefficient of thermal expansion, which means that when you heat it up a little, it expands a lot. So that way you don't need to use a magnifying glass on your thermometer to see if you need a sweater. Mercury also forms mixtures or alloys with a lot of other metals very easily. An alloy with mercury in it is called an amalgam, and they're useful for all sorts of things. For example, if you've ever gotten a silver filling at the dentist, that's a harmless amalgam of metals like mercury, silver, and copper. But some amalgams aren't so harmless, like when mercury comes into contact with pure aluminum. Things get weird pretty quickly, and you definitely don't want it in your teeth. We make so many things, like airplanes, out of aluminum because it's so durable. When most metals are exposed to oxygen, they rust and degrade over time. But when aluminum reacts with oxygen, it forms aluminum oxide, which is non-reactive and protects the pure metal underneath. And normally this is great, unless there's mercury involved. If mercury can get to the pure aluminum, like through a scratch on the plane, it immediately starts to react and seep into the metal, forming an amalgam. And when that amalgam meets the air, it still turns into aluminum oxide oxide, except this time, because there's mercury involved, the reaction doesn't stop. And the aluminum oxide starts to grow out of the plane like some kind of cyberpunk plant. And the mercury isn't consumed during this reaction, so it keeps reacting with more aluminum, and the whole cycle continues until either the mercury evaporates or there's no aluminum left. Which is why you don't want your old-timey thermometer anywhere near a plane. If you have enough of it, the mercury can slowly destroy the integrity of the plane. And even though a tiny amount of mercury probably won't do fatal damage, mercury spills have 
have damaged and even grounded planes in the past. But conveniently, even if you really did want to measure the temperature on your plane, most thermometers these days don't have mercury in them, since it's also toxic if it enters your body. So even though some air travel laws change over time, you probably won't be bringing your mercury thermometer on board anytime soon, and I'm okay with that. After all of the rules comes the second reason flying isn't as much fun as it should be. It's not comfortable. Sure, we're not exhausted from flapping our wings the whole time, but the option to stretch out our arms every now and again would be kind of nice. Here's Olivia, Michael, and then Hank to describe the science behind some of the least comfortable attributes of flight, from recycled air to the dreaded airplane food, and why a flight still takes so long. Have you ever gone on a long flight somewhere and then gotten sick a day or two after landing? The way you got sick might seem obvious. The airplane with all that recycled air making you breathe in everybody else's germs. But even though planes can expose you to disease, they aren't, like, giant germ incubators. Let's start with the idea that planes are recycling their air picking up germs from people 10 rows behind you and blasting it in your face through the vents. That's only partially true. Sure, planes do use recycled air. About half of the air on most planes is filtered and recirculated over and over again. The rest is fresh air that comes in from outside the plane through the engine compressors. It's mixed with the recirculated air in the cabin. Just because air is recirculated, though, doesn't mean it's going to be a hotbed of contagious disease. In fact, most planes use high-efficiency particulate air, or HEPA filters, the type that hospitals use in their operating rooms and intensive care units to keep the air free of bacteria and viruses. These filters work by letting air flow through tiny holes that other particles get blocked in, kind of like a colander for dust and bacteria. To be certified as a HEPA filter, a filter has to be tested with particles that are just 0.3 microns. That's three ten thousandths of a millimeter. And it has to block at least 99.97% of them. The air on the plane is recirculated 20 to 30 times per hour, giving it plenty of chances to be filtered. What's more, the air that comes out of the vent above your head leaves the cabin through a grill along the wall in or very near your row. This means the air isn't flowing forward or backward through the plane. So the air you're breathing probably isn't carrying bacteria or viruses from people who aren't already sitting right next to you. Of course, if the person in the seat next to yours sneezes all over you, then you do run the risk of catching something. But that had less to do with the air on the plane and more to do with being close to other people, just as you might on a bus or a train or at school or your office. So if you get sick on a plane, don't blame the air. Blame your seat assignment. So what's the deal with airline food anyway? I mean, it's bad, it's bland, and a lot of the time they still make you pay extra for it. But it's not necessarily the airline's fault that the food doesn't taste good. It turns out, it's actually your fault. Well, to be more specific, it's your taste buds' fault. See, how your taste buds perceive the flavor of food is influenced by a few major factors, including humidity, air pressure, your sense of smell, and weirdly enough, your hearing. And when you're flying in an airplane, all of these factors change by quite a bit. Comfortable humidity levels for humans are in the 40 to 70 percent range, but airline cabins are pretty dry. The humidity can drop down to 20% or even lower. That's drier than some deserts. And of course, the air pressure on an airplane is much lower than when you're standing on the ground. The cabins are pressurized, otherwise you'd have a very hard time breathing, but the pressure during a typical plane ride is about the same as standing on top of a 2,500 meter mountain. This combination of dryness and low pressure usually leads to xerostomia, less formally known as cotton mouth. A dry mouth has less saliva in it, which can lower your taste bud sensitivity by about 30%, making it harder to taste anything, especially sweet and salty foods. And it's not just your mouth that dries out, your nose does too, making it harder to sniff out odors. And smell can be a huge component of flavor. So not being able to taste much is hard enough, but when you add in the impact on your ability to smell your food in an airplane, well, it's hard out there for an airline chef. Finally, and also kind of strangely, sounds can have a lot to do with taste. Some studies have found that people who eat in noisy environments rate their food as less salty and less sweet than people who eat in complete silence. Scientists aren't totally sure how noise changes the way things taste, but it might have something to do with how a nerve called the chorda tympani reacts to certain sounds. It runs from the taste buds at the front of your tongue to your middle ear. So a constantly humming jet engine, not to mention crying babies, chatty neighbors, and rattling drink carts, might also make plain food taste more bland. However, not all flavors get affected in the same way. Sure, sweet and salty foods don't pop as much in the sky, but researchers have found that other flavors taste basically the same, and in some cases, even stronger than they do on solid ground. Tomato juice, for example, is an in-flight favorite. Lots of people who aren't a fan of the red stuff on the ground, describing it as earthy and musty, have no problem ordering it in the air, where they say it tastes cooler and fruitier. That's led some scientists to think that in noisy environments, the umami, or savory taste, is actually 
actually enhance. Tomatoes are rich in umami, so that's why tomato juice and Bloody Marys might taste better to you in the air than on the ground. So the next time you're offered one of those food trays, it might be worth asking for a nice, fresh glass of tomato juice to help wash it down. Commercial jets are amazingly convenient and super fast, but if you look at their history, you will notice something a little bit weird. The first passenger jet, called the de Havilland Comet, entered commercial service in 1952, and it flew at about 740 kilometers per hour. Next came the Soviet Union's Tupolev Tu-104, which maxed out at about 950 kilometers per hour. And then there was the Boeing 707 in 1958, which had a top speed of 965 kilometers per hour. Per hour. Which, for the record, is about the same speed as commercial jets flying today. So what gives? Why have passenger jets been stuck at this speed for more than 60 years? I want to go places faster! Well, if you're looking for somebody to blame, and I am, don't point your fingers at the engineers. You can instead blame air molecules. To understand this speed limit, you have to know a little bit about airplane wings. If you were to slice off the end of a wing and look at the cross-section, you would see a shape like a squished teardrop. That's called the airfoil, and it's a major part of what gives planes lift. As the plane moves forward, air travels under and over the wing, and the teardrop shape creates two distinct regions, an area of high-pressure air below the wing and one of low-pressure air above it. Ultimately, the high-pressure air and ends up pushing upward, which pushes on the wing and keeps you chilling in the sky, eating that free bag of slightly stale pretzels. But lift isn't the most important thing in this conversation. After all, while this is happening, the plane also is hurtling forward at hundreds of kilometers per hour. That means air isn't just sitting around in these high and low-pressure bubbles. It's flowing over the wings at incredibly high speeds. And here's the really important thing. In a low-pressure environment, fluids like air air move even faster. So even though your plane might only be going three-quarters of the speed of sound, the air molecules zooming over the wing get a kick, and they get going so fast they start to break the sound barrier. And that is where the trouble happens. See, even though those first air molecules broke the sound barrier, the molecules behind them did not. And the thing about molecules is that they really want to fit in. They want to reach an equilibrium. So once the first air molecules break the speed of sound, they immediately want to slow down again and match the molecules around them. That creates a sudden pressure difference called a shock wave. And if that sounds like a bad thing to you, you're right. Right behind this shock wave, the air expands, and that uses up energy that could have contributed to the plane's lift and speed. This phenomenon is what's called wave drag, and ultimately it slows a plane down, forcing it to use significantly more energy and fuel to maintain the same speed. For the record, of course, anything moving through air has some drag, but wave drag is a separate problem. At an altitude of 10 kilometers, it's strongest from roughly 850 to 1,300 kilometers per hour, and it's worst exactly at the speed of sound. So planes are optimized to go as fast as they can without running into wave drag. And that means passenger jets are topping out with a flight speed of about 800 to 950 kilometers per hour, just like they did in the 50s. Of course, there is a loophole to this rule. Like, technically, once you get above about 1,300 kilometers per hour, you don't have to worry about wave drag because the airflow around the plane stays stabilizes. That was one of the benefits to flying on the Concorde, a sleek, futuristic-looking passenger jet that hit the skies in the late 60s. This thing could fly at double the speed of sound, so it could take off from London at 9 a.m. and get you to New York at 7.30 a.m. the same day. That's, of course, partly thanks to time zones, but the plane did help out a lot. Still, this thing had problems, many of which were insurmountable. Most notably, the Concorde flew so fast that air couldn't get out of its way quickly enough. Instead, it started to pile up, compress around the plane, and make it heat up. That created a lot of drag, which required a lot of extra fuel to counteract. The Concorde used about one metric ton of fuel per person it flew across the Atlantic, and as a result, round-trip tickets cost more than 50,000 US dollars in today's money. In the end, the plane cost so much to develop and guzzled so much fuel, even $50,000 tickets couldn't make it financially viable, and the Concorde's last flight was in 2003. That means that unless someone has some 
some engineering breakthrough that somehow fixes wave drag, we're probably going to be stuck at our measly 950 kilometers per hour for the foreseeable future. But that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. These days, instead of focusing on speed, engineers are designing new jet engines that improve efficiency so our flights can be cheaper and more friendly to the Earth. So yes, I might not be able to fly from London to New York in four hours, but at least I'll be saving some cash and helping the planet, which in the grand scheme of things is pretty all right. Okay, I guess we don't want to go so fast that we accidentally heat up the airplane we're flying in. So just add that to the list of terrifying things that could happen on a plane. Maybe it would go just below getting struck by lightning and turbulence. In fact, that's reason number three that flying isn't more fun. It's terrifying. So here's what happens if your plane experiences those terrifying things. Here's a statistic for you. The average plane gets struck by lightning about once a year. Because people really need another reason to be afraid of flying. But lightning almost never causes plane crashes. At least not anymore. So what makes planes so safe in thunderstorms? Well, a lot of it has to do with what they're made of. Planes are usually made of metals like aluminum, and the ones with parts that aren't usually have metal frames or fibers in their shells. And metals tend to be good conductors of electricity. When conductors without any big gaps in them, like the outsides of planes, get hit by rapid bursts of charges like lightning bolts, the atoms in the conductor push all those incoming charges out onto the conductor's surface, instead of letting them inside. In other words, lightning never makes it to the inside where passengers and crew and jet fuel are. It gets stopped by the plane's surface. The process is known as the skin effect, and it's also the reason you're safe from lightning in a car. A lot of people think it's the tires, but the tires have nothing to do with it. It's all thanks to the metal shell of the car, which pushes the lightning to the outside instead of letting it get into the inside where you are. The skin effect is so effective that you'd be completely safe inside of a shell of aluminum just a few millimeters thick even while lightning hit the outside. Even though the metal shell should mean that planes are safe, lightning did used to cause plane crashes. Back in 1963, for example, lightning went through a plane's fuel tank and caused an explosion that killed all 81 people on board. So things can still go wrong even with the skin effect helping out. Lightning can be powerful enough to punch holes straight through the thinner parts of planes, like their wings or noses. But small holes aren't the main concern when it comes to lightning. Planes have lots of wires and electrical instruments, and as you can probably imagine, sensitive electronics tend to go haywire if lightning goes through them. But engineers have learned from their mistakes. Today's fuel tanks are rigorously tested to make sure they have no problem with standing lightning bolts. And the fuel itself has been changed over the past few decades so that it doesn't produce as many explosive gases while in the tank. All the instruments on board are also grounded by connecting them to something like the plane's metal surface, which gets rid of extra current coming in from lightning. There are even little strips or conductive sticks near a especially sensitive equipment like radar that acts like lightning rods and makes sure that the radar doesn't get struck directly. Storms are still dangerous places to fly for lots of reasons, from wind and rain to air turbulence, but at least lightning isn't really one of them anymore. If you've ever flown in an airplane, you've probably felt it. Whether you're cruising at 10,000 meters or about to land, turbulence can be a frightening experience. But what's surprising to me is that some scientists have been afraid of turbulence too, but for different reasons. Richard Feynman described turbulence as the most important unsolved problem of classical physics. In its scientific definition, turbulence is the flow of a fluid, like air or water, that is irregular, chaotic, and unpredictable. Mathematically, it is vexing, which is why we continue to use wind tunnels when testing aerodynamics of airplanes and cars. We simply don't have computers powerful enough to model the complexities of turbulence. But when lay people talk about turbulence on an airplane, mostly we're talking about the shaking and grumbling and dropping and lifting that's caused by the actual turbulent air around it. And that can be caused by a number of things. Probably the most common is thunderstorms, also known as convective weather patterns. Turbulence associated with storms is the result of water vapor condensing into droplets. When that droplet condenses, it releases tiny any amount of latent heat. And when this happens a lot, it creates sudden masses of warm air that can cause updrafts and downdrafts strong enough to move a plane up or down by hundreds of meters. This does not happen to your plane, though, because your pilot is not flying straight into the heart of a storm, hopefully, because radar and meteorologists exist, and flights can be quickly rerouted. Additionally, like big churning storms, mountains are pretty easy for pilots to spot, too. But even so, mountain range turbulence 
distance is still hard to predict. When wind blows perpendicular to a mountain, it's forced over the range, creating swirling eddies and oscillation, much like an ocean wave breaking over a sandbar. Not only can these waves of air be powerful, but they can extend hundreds of kilometers from a mountain, surprising pilots who think that they're clear of turbulent air. And then there's clear air turbulence, which occurs in clear, open conditions when a large mass of moving air meets another air mass that's moving at a different speed. The most common culprits here are jet streams, the giant currents that form when Arctic air meets warmer air from the south. These rivers of air can travel at 100 kilometers an hour or more. Where they meet the slower moving air around them, they can form lots of large eddies of confused, turbulent air. These rapid changes in wind speed are known as wind shears, and because the boundaries of jet streams are always shifting unpredictably, they can seem to come out of nowhere, even in beautiful blue skies. A final kind of unexpected source of turbulence, airplanes themselves. The tips of airplanes' wings cause vortices of wake turbulence, which, while cool to look at, are the reason that pilots have to wait a long time before taking off or landing after the plane in front of them. Thankfully, science has gotten a good enough grasp on the problem of turbulence to help us travel safely and usually comfortably. I know that I, for one, am much more comfortable with things that are just mathematically scary. So yes, turbulence is scary. But at least there's less turbulence than there used to be because of how high we fly. That's just one of the reasons Hank is about to give for why planes fly so high. After going through all of the not-so-fun aspects of flying, we are improving. So we'll land this video on a high note. You frequent flyer types are probably used to it, but the fact is, when we travel by air, we are way up there. The average cruising altitude of a commercial jet is 7.5 to 11 kilometers. In horizontal terms, that is at least as far as the average distance between you and the nearest Starbucks at any given moment. In vertical terms, well, that's a long way down. The good news is if the plane starts to fall, it has a long time to figure out how to stop falling. But we've been flying that high ever since the development of the jet engine in the mid-1950s. And jets were designed to fly at these high altitudes because because there's less air up there, and that's what engineers, passengers, and airlines all prefer. Basically, there are far fewer air molecules at, say, 30,000 feet, or 9 kilometers, than at sea level, so the plane is literally running into fewer molecules. This means it doesn't have to produce as much thrust in order to maintain the speed necessary to fly. So it can travel more efficiently, which is what the airlines want. What the passengers want is to not feel like they're flying in the air at all, and flying at higher altitudes means being able to fly over at least some of the the weather patterns and air currents that older, less powerful propeller planes often had to fly through. So flying higher usually means a more comfortable flight. But there are some trade-offs for this efficiency and comfort. In order to stay in the air, an airplane needs to maintain lift, the force that counteracts its weight. At lower altitudes, having lots of air around helps a plane get lift, but the higher it goes, the harder it is to maintain. So engineers had to find ways to generate more lift in other ways, like making planes with larger wings. Jets can't fly too high, though. In order to, like, continue working, jet engines need to burn fuel. That is an important part of the process. And to burn stuff, you need oxygen. So planes have to stay at altitudes where there's still enough oxygen to mix with the jet fuel and allow combustion to happen. To get any higher, your aircraft would have to pack canisters of air to mix with the fuel, and once you do that, you're not an airplane anymore, you're basically a rocket. So engineers have done the math and found the optimal height for efficient travel and designed planes to operate best at that height. Yay, engineers! So ultimately, planes, well, they're not so bad. They do the job better than anything else we've made so far, and without them, mere humans can't fly at all. Thank you for watching this SciShow video. If you wish it were longer, you can watch another SciShow compilation video about planes next.